analyzing leaders, they find that they all have seven qualities in common. And these qualities are all learnable qualities. And they learn, you learn them by practice. Whatever you dwell upon, or think about, grows in your mentality. You think about these qualities, you to develop the qualities. Number one, the most important quality is the vision. Leaders have vision. Peter Drucker said that if you do not have a vision to be a world leader when you start your business on your kitchen table, you'll probably never be very successful. Imagine you could be a world leader. He asked the question, well, if I was the world leader in my field, how would I be different from today? How would my company be different from today? Cannot achieve. You cannot write it down. You don't know what it is. Clear, fuzzy. It's almost like you're driving claw night. And you write it down as there's a direct relationship between how clear your ideal future is on paper. You may not even know clearly where you're going to achieve it. All you have to do is clear about what you want. There's a difference between winners and losers in every field. Winners take the first step with no guarantee of success. Second quality is courage. Two qualities that every single leader had in common. Vision. Exciting picture of the future that they wanted to create. Courage. The courage to take action on the vision with no guarantees. Nothing worthwhile in life. Possible. In a risk. The risk is that it won't work. Move out of the comfort zone. The biggest single limitation on success in work today is the comfort zone. You will become comfortable doing things a certain way. There is a whole new field that I work in called business no, innovation. As a rapid change, our business, most business models are obsolete. The wonderful thing about business model innovation is that it's a skill. They're all learnable. As you can learn, you've got to get out of your company. Hardest thing for all companies, biggest single, well, set. People want to check. Comfortable doing it the old way. Child. Third quality of leadership worldwide is integrity. It's impossible to follow someone if you don't believe them. If you don't believe that they say is true. The biggest mistake that leaders can make is to make a promise and not keep the promise. They say that they will do something and then not do it. So, integrity is considered the most important skill. It even comes before leaders with vision, courage. So it's really important if you're a leader, you have a reputation. Everybody won't know who you are. And you will be fit. The number four is responsibility. Leaders do not criticize or complain. When you criticize anything or anyone, actually you weaken yourself. And when you become weak, you become little. In the military academies, whenever you are with a senior officer, and you have, let us say, you have your five. You. Dot iron. S.A. Cadet. Buy a shirt jacket. An iron. And you're only allowed to give one of three answers. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse. That's how they train the top officers in the world. Because they know that the nothing makes a person weaker or littler. Always making excuses. No leader could be a leader. All they did was make excuses. Henry Ford once gave this motto for success. It's never complain, never explain. This is the fifth quality. Leaders is excellence. Leaders set high standards. Leaders uh, work for excellence in products and services. Is they're constantly striving. They did a study recently. Fastest growing small and medium sized companies in America. These companies in three years had grown 10, 20, 50, 100 times in size. Profit. They study, they say, what is the most important factor in the success of these businesses? All in very competitive fields. Tremendous. Number one was quality. The products and services they produced were recognized as being top quality. And leaders of those companies were intensely focused on improving quality. Every day they're looking for ways to improve the products and services in the way that they take care of their customers. And sometimes one small change makes a tremendous difference. So, number six is communication. Leaders are good communicators. Those who lead are the ones who can clearly talk about what they believe. Let's imagine that we're out on a, on a tour, a three-hour tour on the boat. 
and we get stranded on a desert island. Well, one of us stands up and says, I will leave. We want to follow the second guy. The only thing we have is his conviction, his absolute belief in the existence of that world that we cannot see. And his ability to put that future state into words that we're drawn to. And we will volunteer to go with him, maybe even take personal risk. The irony is our own survival depends on our ability to help each other. This is the irony. And here we go, we have to cross rivers and go around boulders and chop down trees. And eventually we come to where he said the fishing village is. And there's no fishing village. And he turns to us and says, I believe there was a fishing village. But that doesn't matter because look what we were able to do. We were able to get through that forest together. That's called leadership. When people believe what you believe, they will work for you with blood and sweat and tears. When they don't believe what you believe, they work for your money. The seventh quality of leadership is action. The action orientation is the critical thing. If a person takes action quickly on a new idea, chances are they're going to be successful bought by when you take action is you get three benefits. The first benefit is that you get feedback, which enables you to self-correct. And all of life is a process of experimenting. Second of all is you get ideas. It makes you smarter. It activates more uh, of your brain. Sitting there passively doesn't do anything. But taking action actually sort of lights up your brain like a Christmas tree. Uh, and the third area, third factor is that taking action gives you confidence. The more confidence you have, the more creative you are, the more energy you have, here you are, you feel like you're in control of your life, you feel powerful. And that is why the difference, the top 20% of people in every society and business are proactive, constantly taking action. The bottom 80% are passive, is they're waiting for someone else to come and tell them what to do. And so since you are highly proactive, you're obviously in the top, of the top 10% of your field. And the people in the top 10% are the ones they call the progress, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term is a person who acts like a leader is a leader that minute the person can go from being a passive person a follower to being a leader in one instant uh, all you have to do is begin to act like a leader think like a leader and act like a leader number one your personal leadership ability is the major limit on what you can achieve because what you do is you set a goal and you make a plan and you work on that goal every single day that's your leadership when a team is in trouble, they don't fire the players, they change the coach. When a company's in trouble, they don't fire the staff, they bring you a new leader. A new leader can, can transform an organization. Number two is leadership is the ability to get results. Do you get the results that are expected of you? Well, you get the results that you have committed to get. If you start your own business, the results you committed to get it are getting, making sales, generating profits to provide for yourself and your family and so on and so forth. So results are the key. So I call, like, like a semicolon or a colon, there's a one-to-one -one between leadership and results. You can be a leader without followers. You don't have to have been. As long as you're getting results, you're a leader. Third is leaders have a clear vision of the future. Top 10% of people have a very clear idea of where they're going. They have clear goals and clear plans they're working on. Drucker said that leaders think about the future. A vision is an ideal future picture. It helps the company decide what they should be doing more of, what they should be doing less of, what is consistent with their philosophy and their values and what is not. So it's very important that individuals and organizations sit down and think through what the vision should be. Decide what's right before you decide what's possible. Imagine that your company is now perfect in every respect. It has the finest people, products, processes and services. What would it look like? What would it stand for? Allow yourself to play with this idea. It's just called blue sky thinking, and it's practiced by all peak performing executives. They allow themselves to dream and to visualize what the very ideal would be. Leaders expect to fail over and over again. They don't like it, they don't want it, they avoid it if they possibly can, but they know it is an inevitable part of moving forward, but they're willing to take it, they're willing to take the pain okay, in pursuit of success. You'll find that successful people fail far more than unsuccessful people. Successful people hate the, hate the failure and they don't like the risk but they take it anyway because that's... So therefore when you, when you have a situation where you have to take a risk, do everything possible to mitigate your risk. Interesting discovery, successful entrepreneurs are not risk seekers. They are very clever risk avoiders in pursuit of profit. They are not out there throwing their money around like gamblers in Las Vegas. They are very careful with their money. They know that in any case a good friend of mine said two-thirds of your, of your investment, no matter how much due diligence you do, will not work out. 
You just have to minimize your losses. The best information, maximize your profits. Don't ever be afraid of taking out, taking, taking a risk in the pursuit. Number two is to market and innovate. Always looking for faster, better, newer, more original, different, cheaper ways to get the job done more effectively for yourself and your organization. Encouraging people to be creative means encouraging them to come up with ideas and never raining on their parade. The Japanese employees of large corporations generate a hundred times the number of ideas that employees of American corporations generate. And you know the reason? The reason is because every single idea is respected and every single idea is encouraged and every single person with an idea gets an opportunity to try it out on a small scale. In American corporations, however, when somebody comes up with an idea, everybody takes turn dumping on the idea and pointing out all the holes in the ideas. So welcome ideas and encourage creativity. Allow people to come up with even ridiculous ideas and just listen to them. Three, set priorities and work on key tasks. There's always a hundred things that you can do, but the ability to set priorities is one of the most important of all skills that we have as an adult. Number four is focus and concentrate where superior results are possible. And this is important. Ben Trigo had the very worst use of time is to do very well what need not be done at all. It's amazing how many of us spend an enormous amount of time working on something that need not be done at all. It's the rule for great success. Yes, do fewer things, but do more important things and do more of them and get better at them. Do fewer things, but do more important things, and do them more often, get better at them. And that alone will double your income. Number five is solve problems and make decisions. Your ability to solve problems is usually the critical factor in your promotion, income, your success, so on. Colin Powell um, said that leadership is the ability to solve problems. Between you and any goal you have, as your financial goal, the only thing that stands between you is problems. Your ability to remove the obstacles that hold you back from achieving your financial goals is the critical skill of all. Thinking, that then, de defining the problems clearly, by defining the solutions clearly, picking the most important solution to the most important problem and taking action on it, and, working on it and expecting it not to work a few times until you finally wake it through. Number six, lead by example. Be a role model. Once you take the roles, everybody is watching you. And your job is to be a role model. Can't sit, live your life as though your every act were to become a universal law. As a leader, if you set high standards for yourself, you will be, by extension, setting high standards for others. Remember, everybody watches you. You're the standard bearer. You know, if you have children, what they found in psychology is that children are more influenced by your example than by anything else that you do or say. Well, and anything else that you say. Number seven is perform and get results. What can you and only you do that if done well can make a real difference? Sometimes it's a decision you need to make or a customer you need to call or a sales plan you need to initiate. But there's always something that you and only you can do. If you don't do it, nobody else will do it. But if you do do it and you do it well, it can make a real difference. And whatever you're doing, if it's not the most valuable, you stop doing it and start doing what is. This takes tremendous discipline, but as Goethe said, everything is hard before it's easy. Good habits are hard to form, and the most important of all habit to fo habits to form is the habit of working on the most valuable thing you can possibly do. Leadership and self-discipline go hand in hand. It is not possible to imagine an effective leader who lacks self-discipline, willpower, self-control, and self-mastery. The overarching characteristic of a leader is that he is in complete control of himself and every situation. There's seldom been a time in history when leaders were so needed and so much in demand as today. We need leaders at every level of society, both in the profit and non-profit sectors. We need leaders in our families, businesses, places of worship, community organizations and especially politics. We need men and women who take their responsibilities seriously and are willing to step forward to take command of the situation. Fortunately, leadership is learnable. Leaders are developed, usually self-developed, over time through hard work, experience, and training. As Peter Drucker once said, there may be natural born leaders, but there are so few of them that they make no difference in the great scheme of things. Four Stages of Development in your career in business, you progress through four levels of activity and attainment. 
First you start off as an employee with limited knowledge and experience. Then as you grow, learn and develop the ability to get results, you evolve upward and become a supervisor with responsibility for the performance and results of other people. As you continue to move up the scale of supervision, improving your ability to get things done through others from directly overseeing the work of employees, you become a manager, someone who assigns work to people with demonstrated competence in certain areas. Managers have a larger view, and this comes with greater responsibilities. As you move up the scale of management, becoming more knowledgeable and effective in getting more and better results from more and different people, you reach the highest level, that of a leader. At this stage, you are responsible for determining what is to be done rather than how it is to be done. It is said that some leaders are made, some are born, and some people have leadership thrust upon them. Leaders emerge or are promoted to deal with a situation requiring leadership ability. In its simplest terms, the role of the leader is to take responsibility for results. The primary reason that people are promoted into increasingly higher levels of leadership is because they demonstrate the ability to get the required results at each level. The ongoing question of the leader is always, what results are expected of me? Clarity is essential. The main reason that some people are not promoted into greater leadership positions, or perhaps they are even fired, is because of failure to execute. They do not do the most important jobs expected of them, nor do they get the results demanded of them. Leaders have vision. The first quality of leadership based on 3300 studies of leaders reviewed by James McPherson is the quality of vision. Leaders have vision. They have the ability to project forward into the future and develop a clear picture of where they want their organizations to go. They then have the ability to share this vision with others and gain others' commitment to make this vision a reality. You become a leader when you accept responsibility for results. You become a leader when you begin to think, act and talk like a leader. You become a leader when you develop a vision for yourself and for your company, your life or your area of responsibility. There are hundreds of books written about leadership and the importance of vision. Yet they can be boiled down to a single principle. A military leader has a vision of victory from which he never deviates. A business leader has a vision of success for the business based on excellent performance to which he or she is completely committed. A leader is a standard bearer. The leader sets the standard for the organization or the department. It is not possible for anyone in the organization to have a clearer vision or to aspire to a higher standard of excellence than the leader. For this reason, the leader is the role model, the one who sets the tone and the morale for everyone in the organization. The personality and influence of the leader affects everyone below him in the company, organization, or department. You cannot raise morale in a business. It filters down from the top from the leader. The behavior of the leader influences and affects the behavior of everyone else. If the leader is positive, confident, and upbeat, everyone in the organization will be influenced by his behavior and will be more confident, positive, and upbeat as well. Walk the talk. When you become a leader, you must discipline yourself to be leader-like. You must walk, talk, and act the part of a leader. You become a different person with different responsibilities than the manager. When you are working your way up, you are part of the staff or the sales team. When you become a manager, you are part of management. This means that when you are part of the staff, your orientation is upward and sideways. But when you become a leader, your orientation is downward toward all the people for whom you are responsible. Perhaps the most important behavior of a leader is for you to discipline yourself to be your role model. Imagine that everyone is watching you and patterning everything they do and say based on your behavior. When you become a leader, you no longer have the luxury to let it all hang out. From the time you are promoted into leadership, you have a special responsibility to discipline and control your words and behaviors in such a way so that you bring about the very best possible results for your organization and for other people. Set the standards. The leader sets the standards for the organization's behavior, quality of work, personal organization, time management, and appearance. 
Be an excellent organization. The leader is the person who everyone looks up to and wants to emulate. In most cases, the leader works harder than others in the company. The leader appears to be more committed, more determined, more courageous, more visionary, and more persistent than anyone else. The leader sets a tone that everyone wants to emulate. The leader also sets the standard for how people are treated in the organization. When the leader treats people with courtesy, consideration, and concern, it quickly becomes known that these are the standards to which others must adhere. Set the values and principles. In addition to a clear vision for the organization, the leader must have a set of values and organizing principles that guide behavior and decision making. Everyone must know what the leader and the company stands for and believes in. The job of the leader then is to articulate this vision of excellent performance within the constraints of high ethical standards at all times. He or she must walk the talk and live the values and behaviors he or she teaches. The very best standard for a leader is the golden rule: Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For example, when Jack Welch was the president of General Electric, he encouraged managers to treat each employee as if that employee might be promoted over his head sometime in the future, and he might find himself working under the person who is now working below him. This way of thinking assured that managers treated their staff with a high degree of respect and courtesy. Seven principles of leadership. To be an effective leader, there are seven principles you must incorporate. In your leadership behavior and activities, one clarity. This is perhaps your most important responsibility. You must be absolutely clear about who you are and what you stand for. You must be absolutely clear about your vision and where you want to lead your people. You must be absolutely clear about the goals and objectives of the organization and how they are to be achieved. Especially, you must be absolutely clear about the values. Mission and purpose of the organization and what it stands for. Everyone around you and below you must know exactly why they are doing what they do and what their company has been formed to accomplish. Two, competence. As the leader, you must set a standard of excellent performance for the organization as well as for every person and function in the company. Your goal must be for your company to be as good or better than your very best competitor. You must be continually seeking ways to improve the quality of your product and services to your customers. Three commitment. The leader is absolutely committed to the success of the organization and believes completely that this organization is the best in the business or will be the best in the future. This passionate commitment to the organization and to success and achievement motivates and inspires people to do their best work and put their whole hearts into their jobs. Four constraints. The job of the leader is to identify the constraints or limiting factors that set the speed at which the company achieves its most important goals of revenue and profitability. The leader then allocates people and resources to alleviate those constraints and remove the obstacles so it can perform as one of the best in the business. Five creativity. The leader is open to new ideas of all kinds and from all sources. The leader is continually encouraging people to find faster, better, cheaper, and easier ways to produce excellent products and services, and to take better care of customers. Number five: continuous learning. The leader is personally committed to reading, listening, and upgrading his or her personal knowledge and skills as an executive. The leader should attend additional seminars and courses to improve his or her skills and abilities. At the same time, the leader encourages everyone in the organization to learn and grow as a normal and natural part of business life. The leader provides time and resources for training and development. The leader knows that the best companies have the best trained people, the second best companies have the second best trained people, and the third best companies have the least trained people and are on their way out of business. Number seven is consistency. The leader has the self-discipline to be consistent, dependable, reliable, calm, and predictable in all situations. One of the great comforts of business life is for an employee to know that the leader is completely consistent and reliable. An effective leader does not change from day to day, 
The leader is not blown in the wind by each new situation or problem or emergency that arises. Instead, the leader is calm, positive and confident, especially under pressure. The Inevitable Crisis The only thing that is inevitable in the life of the leader is the crisis. When you rise to a position of leadership, you will experience crises repeatedly. Crises that are unpredictable, unbidden, and often capable of seriously damaging the organization. It is in the crisis that the leader demonstrates his competence. In times of crisis, the leader becomes calm, cool, objective, and completely in control. The leader asks questions and gathers information. The leader assesses the situation accurately and makes whatever decisions are necessary to minimize the damage or cut the losses. Great leaders discipline themselves to keep their fears and misgivings private. They do not share their concerns with their staff, knowing that this can cause confusion and loss of morale. Instead, the leader asks a lot of questions, probes deeply into situations so that he or she understands them thoroughly, and keeps his or her feelings private. As far as the members of the organization are concerned, the leader is always calm, positive, relaxed, and in complete control, no matter what is happening. Self-control and leadership there's a direct relationship between your ability to discipline yourself and your behaviors and your readiness to lead. It is only when you prove to others that you are in complete control of yourself that they develop the confidence to put you in a leadership position and keep you there. The leader realizes that everything he says to or about another person is magnified. The leader therefore praises and encourages people, both in their presence and when they are not around. He never says anything negative that could be misinterpreted or that could demotivate or offend another person. If he has problems with someone, he addresses them privately, out of sight and earshot of anyone else. Leadership Qualities Leaders discipline themselves to plan, prepare, organize and check every detail. They take nothing for granted. They ask questions to ensure that they have a complete understanding of a situation, problem, or difficulty. Great leaders act as if they own the entire company. They accept a high level of personal responsibility. The leader never complains, makes excuses, or blames others for problems. Leaders are intensely action-oriented. They gather information carefully and they make the decisions that are necessary. They set measures and standards and hold others to them. They insist that the job be done quickly and well. Leaders rise to the top. Leaders rise to the top of an organization as cream rises in milk. When you accept complete responsibility for getting results, concentrate single-mindedly on completing your most important tasks. Continually upgrade your knowledge and skills as well as your ability to contribute value to your company and treat other people with kindness and consideration, you will emerge as a natural leader. As you demonstrate your ability to make an increasingly valuable contribution to your organization, people above, below, and on both sides of you will want you to be promoted into leadership and will support you when you reach that position. One of your primary aims in life is to walk, talk, act, speak, and treat others as a leader would. Eventually, your position will be equal to your performance. Your ability and willingness to discipline yourself to accept personal responsibility for your life is essential to happiness, health, success, achievement, and personal leadership. Accepting responsibility is one of the hardest of all disciplines, but without it, no success is possible. The failure to accept responsibility and the attempt to foist responsibility for things in your life that make you unhappy onto other people, institutions, and situations completely distorts cause and effect, undermines your character, weakens your resolve, and diminishes your humanity. It leads to making endless excuses. My Great Revelation when I was 21, I was living in a tiny apartment and working as a construction laborer. I had to get up at 5 a.m. so that I could take three buses to work in order to be there by 8 a.m. I didn't get home until 7 p.m. tired out from 
carrying construction materials all day. I was making just enough money to get by and I had no car, almost no savings, and just enough clothes for my needs. I had no radio or television. It was in the middle of a cold winter but the temperature at minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so I seldom went out in the evening. Instead, if I had enough energy, I sat in my small apartment at my cool table in my kitchen nook and read. One evening, late at night, as I was sitting there by myself at the table, it suddenly dawned on me that this is my life. This life was not a rehearsal for something else. The game was on, and I was the main character, as in a play. It was like a flashbulb going off in my face. I looked at myself and around me at my small apartment. Then I considered the fact that I had not graduated from high school. The only work that I was qualified to do was manual labor. I earned just enough money to pay my basic expenses, and I had very little left over at the end of the month. I suddenly knew that unless I changed, nothing else was going to change. No one else was going to do it for me. In reality, no one else really cared. I realized at that moment that from that day forward, I was completely responsible for my life and for everything that happened to me. I was responsible. I could no longer blame my situation on my difficult childhood or mistakes I had made in the past. I was in charge. I was in the driver's seat. This was my life. And if I didn't do something to change it, it would go on like this indefinitely by the simple force of inertia. This revelation changed my life. I was never the same again. From that moment on, I accepted more and more responsibility for everything in my life. I accepted responsibility for doing my job better than before, rather than doing only the minimum that was necessary to avoid getting fired. I accepted responsibility for my finances, my health, and especially my future. The very next day, I went down to a local bookstore at my lunch break. It began the lifelong practice of buying books with information, ideas, and lessons that could help me. I dedicated my life to self-improvement, to continuous learning in every way possible. For the rest of my business life, right up to the present moment, wherever I have wanted or needed to learn something to help me, I have returned to learning, to reading, to listening to audio programs, and attending courses and seminars. I found that you could learn anything you need to learn in order to accomplish any goal you set for yourself. Over time, I learned that fully 80% of the population never accepts complete responsibility for their lives. They continually complain, criticize, make excuses, and blame other people for things in their lives about which they're not happy. The consequences of this way of thinking, however, can be disastrous. They can sabotage all hope for success and happiness later in life. From Childhood to Maturity when you are growing up, from an early age you become conditioned to see yourself as not responsible for your life. This is normal and natural. When you're a child, your parents are in charge. They make all your decisions. They decide what food you will eat, what clothes you will wear, what toys you will play with, what home you will live in, what school you will attend, and what activities you will engage in during your spare time. Because you are young, innocent, and unknowing, you do what they want you to do you have little choice or control. As you grow up, however, you begin to make more and more of your own decisions in each of these areas. But because of your early programming, you are conditioned unconsciously to feel that someone else is still responsible for your life, that there's still someone else out there who can or should take care of you. Most people grow up believing that if something goes wrong, someone else is responsible. Someone else is to blame. Someone else is guilty. Someone else is the villain and they are the victim. As a result, most people make more and more excuses for the things in their lives, past and present, that make them unhappy. Get over the mistakes your parents made. If your parents criticized you or got angry with you for mistakes you made when you were growing up, you began to unconsciously assume that somehow you were at fault. If your parents punished you physically or emotionally for doing or not doing something that pleased or displeased them, you felt inferior and inadequate. When your parents withheld their love to punish you for not doing something they demanded, you might have grown up with deep feelings of guilt, unworthiness and undeservingness. All these negative feelings could then intersect to make you feel like a victim, like you are not responsible for yourself or your life once you became an adult. 
The most common feeling that we have as adults, if we have been raised in a critical home environment, is the feeling that I'm not good enough. Because of this feeling, we compare ourselves unfavorably to others. We think that other people who seem to be happier or more confident are better than us. We develop feelings of inferiority. This can become an emotional trap. The fatal fallacy. If we think for any reason that others are better than us, we unconsciously assume that we must be worse than they are. If they are worth more than we are, we assume that we must be worth less. This feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness lies at the root of most personality problems in our lives, as well as most political and social problems in our world, both nationally and internationally. To escape from these feelings of guilt and worthlessness that have been instilled in us as a result of destructive criticism in childhood, we lash out at our world, other people, and situations. In any part of our life with which we are unhappy or discontented, our first reaction is to look around and ask, who is to blame? Most religions teach the concept of sin, which states that whenever something goes wrong, someone is to blame. Someone has done something bad. Someone is guilty. Someone must be punished. This whole idea of guilt and punishment leads to ever-increasing feelings of anger, resentment, and irresponsibility. An attitude of irresponsibility. Our courts today are clogged with thousands of people demanding redress and payment for something that went wrong in their lives. Backed up by ambitious plaintiff lawyers, people go to court demanding compensation, even if they themselves are completely at fault for what happened, especially if they reform. People don't want to accept responsibility. People spill hot coffee on themselves and sue the fast food restaurant that sold them the coffee in the first place. People get drunk and drive off the road and then turn around and sue the manufacturer of the 15-year-old car they were driving. People climb up on a stepladder and lean over too far, fall into the ground. They then sue the ladder manufacturer for their injury. In each case, people are attempting to escape responsibility for their own behaviors by blaming someone else, making excuses, and then demanding compensation. Eliminating Negative Emotions The common denominator of all people is the desire to be happy. In its simplest terms, happiness arises from the absence of negative emotions. Where there are no negative emotions, all that is left is positive emotions. Therefore, the elimination of negative emotions is your great business in life if you truly wish to be happy. There are dozens of negative emotions. Although the most common are guilt, resentment, envy, jealousy, fear, and hostility, they all ultimately boil down to a feeling of anger directed either inward or outward. Anger is directed inwardly when you bottle it up rather than expressing it constructively to others. Anger is directed outwardly when you criticize or attack other people. Psychosomatic illness. Negative emotions are the major causes of psychosomatic illness. This occurs when the mind, psycho, makes the body soma sick. Negative emotions, especially as expressed in the form of anger, weaken your immune system and make you susceptible to colds, flu, and other diseases. Uncontrolled bursts of anger can actually bring about heart attacks, strokes, and nervous breakdowns. Here's the great discovery. All negative emotions, especially anger, depend for their very existence on your ability to blame someone or something else for something in your life that you're not happy about. It takes tremendous self-discipline to refrain from blaming others for our problems. It takes enormous self-control to refuse to make excuses. It takes tremendous self-discipline for you to accept complete responsibility for everything you are, everything you become, and everything that happens to you. Even if you are not directly responsible for something that happens like Hurricane Katrina, you are responsible for your responses for what you do and say from that moment forward. It takes tremendous self-mastery for you to take complete control of your conscious mind and deliberately choose to think positive, constructive thoughts that enhance your life and improve the quality of your relationships and results. But the payoff of this form of positive thinking is tremendous. Blaming is easy. By following the path of least resistance, the easiest and most mindless behavior of all is for a person to lash out and blame someone else 
anytime anything goes wrong for any reason. People who develop the habit of automatically blaming often become angry at things. Blaming inanimate objects when they do not function as expected is so silly that it almost becomes a mild form of insanity. People become angry at doors that stick. They swear at tools that they're using when they themselves make a mistake. They get mad when their car doesn't start. Even if it is an inanimate object, if it doesn't work perfectly, then the thing must be to blame. People will often kick a car that they are mad at or a box that they tripped over. The Antidote to Negative Emotions The fastest and most dependable way to eliminate negative emotions is to immediately say, I am responsible. Whenever something happens that triggers anger or a negative reaction of any kind, quickly neutralize the feelings of negativity by saying, I am responsible. The law of substitution says that you can substitute a positive thought for a negative one. Since your mind can only hold one thought at a time, when you deliberately choose the positive thought, I am responsible, you cancel out any other thought or emotion at that moment. It is not possible to accept responsibility and remain angry at the same time. It's not possible to accept responsibility and experience negative emotions. It's not possible to accept responsibility without becoming calm, clear, positive and focused once more. As long as you are blaming someone else for something in your life that you don't like, you will remain a mental child. You continue to see yourself as small and helpless like a victim. You continue to lash out. However, when you begin to accept responsibility for everything that happens to you, you transform yourself into a mental adult. You will see yourself as being in charge of your own life and no longer a victim. In Alcoholics Anonymous, people who are having problems with drinking attend meetings with others going through the same situation. What they have found is that until the individual accepts responsibility for his or her problems, both with alcohol and in other areas of life, no progress is possible. But after the person accepts responsibility, everything is possible. This is true with almost every difficult situation in life in which you project your unhappiness onto other people or factors outside yourself. Money and Emotions Many of our biggest problems and concerns in life have to do with money, burying it, spending it, investing it, and especially losing it. As a result, many of our negative emotions are associated with money in some way. However, the fact is that you are responsible for your financial life. You choose. You decide. You're in charge. You cannot blame your financial problems or situation on other people. You are in the driver's seat. So it is only when you accept responsibility for your income. Who chose to accept the job you are working at? Your bills. Who spent the money that put you into debt? And your investments? Who made those decisions? Can you move from becoming an economic child to an economic adult? Responsibility and control. There's a direct relationship between the acceptance of responsibility and the amount of personal control you feel you have over your life. This means that the more you accept responsibility, the greater sense of control you experience. There's also a direct relationship between the amount of control you feel you have and how positive you feel. The more you feel that you have a high sense of control in the important areas of your life, the more positive and happy you are in everything you do. When you accept responsibility, you feel strong, powerful, and purposeful. Accepting responsibility eliminates the negative emotions that rob you of happiness and contentment. In every situation, the antidote to negative emotions is to say, I am responsible. Then, look into the situation to find the reasons why you are responsible for what happened or for what is going on. Your intelligence is like a double-edged sword. It can cut in either direction. You can use your intelligence to rationalize, justify, and blame other people for things you're not happy about, or you can use your intelligence to find reasons why you are responsible for what happened and then take action to solve the problem or resolve the situation. You can make excuses or you can make progress. You choose. Even if an accident has occurred, such as your car being damaged in the parking lot while you were at work, you may not be legally at fault for the accident, but you are still responsible for your responses for how you behave as a result of what happened. Never complain, never explain. 
The mark of the leader, the truly superior person, is that he or she accepts complete responsibility for the situation. It's not possible to imagine a true leader who whines and complains rather than taking action when problems and difficulties arise. The sense of responsibility is the mark of a highly developed personality. You take responsibility for your life by resolving in advance that you will not become upset or angry over something that you cannot affect or change. Just as you do not become angry about the weather, you do not become angry over circumstances and situations over which you have no control. Furthermore, you especially do not allow yourself to be angry and unhappy in the present because of unhappy experiences or situations from the past. You say, what cannot be cured must be endured. It's amazing how many people are unhappy today because of a past event, even something that happened many years ago. Each time they think of the negative experience, they become angry or depressed once more. The good news is that at any time you can stop thinking about discussing and rehashing the past, you can let it go and begin thinking instead about your goals and your unlimited future. As Helen Keller said, when you turn toward the sunshine, the shadows fall behind you. Self-mastery and self-control. Any self-discipline, self-mastery, and self-control begins with taking responsibility for your emotions. You take charge of your emotions by accepting 100% responsibility for yourself and for your responses to everything that happens to you. You refuse to make excuses, complain, criticize, or blame other people for anything. Instead, you say, I am responsible, and then you take action of some kind. The only antidote is action. The only real antidote for anger or worry is purposeful action in the direction of your goals, which is the subject of the next chapter. Before you turn to that, however, resolve today to first take complete control of your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and then to get so busy working on things that are important to you that you don't have time to think about or express negative emotions to or about anyone for any reason. When you exert your self-discipline and willpower in the acceptance of personal responsibility for your life, you take complete control of your thoughts and feelings. By doing so, you become a much more effective, happy, and positive person in everything you do. I used to think that setting goals was the key to being successful, but the more I think about it, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize that accepting responsibility for your life is the starting point of all great accomplishment and it's been well said over and over again that it's not the government and it's not our parents and it's not your boss and it's not your family or your bills it's you one of the things I found and it's sometimes it's hard to get used to is the fact that no one else can live your life for you no one else can make decisions for you and in the final analysis no one else really cares and without the acceptance of responsibility nothing else is possible Walking, talking, thinking, and acting like a fully responsible human being gives you a feeling of calmness, confidence, and self-control. Your income, your status, your security, your power will always tend to be equal to the responsibilities you take on. This is one distinct area where winners and losers are company. Winners always look upon themselves as the cause of what happens to them. Losers are always blaming someone or something else. We know that people always seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want. And if something goes wrong, the thing that they want is to get off the hook. So the fastest and easiest way is always to blame someone else. But when we blame someone else, to that degree, we give control of the problem to that other person. And we take control away from ourselves. And we become more negative and we become more frustrated the more we try to make other people responsible for things in our life that we don't want. In fact, if you stop blaming other people, you'll find that most of your negative emotions will go away if you can't blame anybody. And the way you stop blaming is to accept responsibility. Losers never accept responsibility and winners always do. When things go well for losers, they blame it on luck. And when things go poorly for losers, they blame it on the system. But winners accept both the credit and the blame for everything that happens to them. Fully responsible adults always look upon themselves as self-employed. They act as if they own the place. They treat the company they work for as though it belonged to them. The worst mistake you can ever make in your life is to ever think that you work for anybody else but yourself. All peak performers in every field and industry look upon themselves as though they worked 
for themselves. You hear somebody else signs their paycheck, they look upon themselves as being self-employed. And they treat the company as though it belonged to them. They treat the company as though everything that happened in that company was theirs. They accept full responsibility. If the paper clip falls on the floor, they pick it up. They never say, that's not my job. When they refer to their company, they say, mm, us, and our, and we. This company instead of they, and them, and the boss, and so on. Wherever you see an employee who is not totally committed to the company and to their work, you see a problem. And you see a person that you should never allocate more responsibility to. When they come out of school, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that if we are to be educated further, it is up to our employer to do it. And this is one of the worst mistakes that you can make because irrespective of whether or not your employer offers you training opportunities, you are 100% responsible for continuing to upgrade your skills. Now here's another area of responsibility. The winner always asks, what results are expected of you? One of the qualities of peak performers is that they are always very results oriented. They always ask themselves, why am I on the payroll? And if you're not sure why you're on the payroll, the first thing that you have to do is go and sit down with your boss and ask him, why am I on the payroll? Now you don't have to use these words, but here's a very simple technique. Take and write out a job description about what you think that you're on the payroll to do. Write out a list of all the things that you're supposed to accomplish and give it to your boss and have your boss organize that list in order of priority, which is most important, which is second in importance, which is third in importance. And that always work on what is most important to your boss. Ask yourself, what can I and only I do that if done well will make a real difference to my company? If you own your own company, this question is even more important. But working for another company, this is the key to rapid advancement and promotion. And do what will make a difference. Accept responsibility for specific results and always results that will make a difference. Winners always focus on solutions. They ask, where do we go from here? What do we do from here? There's a big difference between winners and losers. Winners always look to the future, and losers always look to the past. Winners always look to what can be done, and losers always look at who's to blame. Losers focus on problems, winners focus on solutions. Winners always look to themselves. When there is a problem, losers always look to others. So if you want to achieve success within your work, always look to yourself when everything things don't go right. The rejection of responsibility leads to negative emotions, it leads to stress, it leads to denial and anger and frustration and often psychosomatic illness. That negative mind actually depresses the immune system and makes the body sick. I think the refusal to accept responsibility for one's life is the primary reason for negativity and unhappiness in our society. Today, many doctors are asking patients a question like this. Why did you need this yas? Why did you need this illness? Because what they're finding is that when people become sick, it's almost invariably because they need an illness to help them avoid dealing with some situation in their life. So what they do is they contract an illness which is consistent with the severity of the situation. For instance, if you're feeling a little bit tired and overworked, you contract a cold. If you're feeling uh, very, very harassed or frustrated in your life, you get something worse. Right up to and including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. They found that many sick people, and especially very sick people, have a tendency to hold grudges for long periods of time, and that forgiving others is a vital part of getting over the illness. In my experience, and as you cannot forgive offenses against you, to that degree you are held back from success. And the more grudges you have, the more bitter you are, the less forgiving you are, the more unhappy you will be all of your life. So make it a rule, as they say, never to let the sun go down on your anger. Make it a rule to forgive everybody in your life who has ever done anything who has hurt you. And let it go past so that you can commit all of your energies toward accomplishing the things you really want in life. Well, what have we learned with regard to responsibility? Number one is that the acceptance of responsibility for your life is the stepping stone. The performance that until you accept responsibility for your life, nothing better. Number two is the more self-responsible you feel the more control you have, and the better you like yourself. And the higher is your self-esteem. Number three, the expression of negative emotions caused by blaming others causes you to lose control and suffer diminished self-esteem. So catch yourself and stop yourself from blaming others by catching yourself and saying, I am responsible. I am responsible. I am responsible. Remember the responsible person is solution-oriented. 
focused on the future rather than the past, in what can be done versus who did what. All human beings make mistakes because we are anxious to get things and to do things the fastest and easiest way because often we're ignorant and we don't know everything we need to know because often we're ambitious and we're in a hurry because often we are vain and our ego is getting away because of these things we make mistakes and all human beings make mistakes and a person who cannot accept the fact that others make mistakes is not cut out for greatness is not cut out for leadership number five the acceptance of complete responsibility for your success it is the starting point of all great achievement we used to sit down and say that if anything that is going to happen to you or for you in my is up to you. That you cannot wait or hope that other people will do things for you that you must take complete charge. Now you will find a very interesting thing that when you accept total responsibility for your life, other people will help you. And if you don't, nobody will help you even if they do. It won't do any good. So say to yourself, what is it that I want to cop? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? What do I want to have? And what do I have to do to get there? And then take full charge. Yes. Number six, take a habit of forgiving others. Never carrying grudges around. Keep your mind calm, positive, be focused on your goals. Your ability to eliminate the expression of negative emotions, to keep your mind positive by not becoming angry or frustrated, is a hallmark of a successful personality and a healthy personality. And your tendency to blame others, to hold grudges, not to forgive others, is something that can cause you to fail within the reaching you want. Number seven, finally, ask yourself each day, what kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it is just like me? What kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it just like me? This is the question of the truly responsible individual, and you will be amazed at how rapidly an attitude of responsibility can accelerate your career. If you walk, talk, and act like a responsible, self-assured individual, you will begin to feel calm, confident, and positive about yourself. If you will resist the expediency factor, the tendency to blame others when things go wrong, if you will discipline yourself, you accept full responsibility for what happens in your life, it will raise your self-esteem and make you feel much better about yourself and everything that you're doing. By practicing the self-discipline necessary to refrain from blaming anyone for anything, you will develop courage, character, and self-esteem. If you do what successful people do, you will be successful too, and all successful men and women are self-responsible. When I was 21, I was broke and living in a small one-room apartment in the middle of a very cold winter, working on a construction job during the day. I usually couldn't afford to go out of my apartment in the evenings where at least it was warm, so I had a lot of time to think. One night, as I sat there at my small kitchen table, I had a great flash of awareness. It changed my life. I suddenly realized that everything that happened to me for the rest of my life was going to be up to me. No one else was ever going to help me. No one was coming to the rescue. I was thousands of miles from home where I'd grown up and had no intentions of going back for a long time. I saw clearly at that moment that if anything in my life were going to change, it would have to begin with me. If I didn't change, nothing else would change. I was responsible. I still remember that moment. It was like a first parachute jump. It was both scary and exhilarating. There I was, standing on the edge of life, and I decided to jump. From that moment onward, I accepted that I was in charge of my life. I knew that if I wanted things to be different, I would have to be different. Everything was up to me. Sadly enough, most people never do this. I've met countless men and women in their 40s and 50s who are still grumbling and complaining about earlier unhappy experiences and still blaming their problems on other people and circumstances. The greatest enemies of success and happiness are negative emotions of all kinds. It is negative emotions that hold you down, tire you out, and take away all your joy in life. One of your most important goals if you want to be truly happy and successful is to free yourself from negative emotions and fortunately this can be done if you learn how. The negative emotions of fear, self-pity, envy, jealousy, feelings of inferiority and ultimately anger are mostly caused by four factors. 
Once you identify and remove these factors from your thinking, your negative emotions stop automatically. The first of the four root causes of negative emotions is justification. You can only be negative as long as you can justify to yourself and others that you are entitled to be angry or upset for some reason. This is why angry people continually explain and elaborate on the reasons for their negative feelings. However, if you cannot justify your negativity, you cannot be angry. The second cause of negative emotions is rationalization. When you rationalize, you attempt to give a socially acceptable explanation for an otherwise socially unacceptable act. You rationalize to explain away or to put a favorable light on something that you have done that you feel bad or unhappy about. You excuse your behavior or actions by creating an explanation that sounds good, even though you know that you were an active agent in whatever occurred. You often create complex ways of putting yourself in the right by explaining that your behavior was pretty quite acceptable, all things considered. This rationalizing keeps your negative emotions alive. Rationalization and justification always require that you make someone or something else the source or cause of your problem. You cast yourself in the role of the victim and you make the other person or organization into the oppressor or the bad guy. The third cause of negative emotions is an overconcern or hypersensitivity to the way that others treat you. For some people, their entire self-image is determined by the way others speak to them, talk to them or about them or even look at them. They have little sense of personal value or self-worth apart from the opinions of others. And if those opinions are negative for any reason, real or imagined, the victim immediately experiences anger, embarrassment, shun, feelings of inferiority, and even depression, self-pity, and despair. This explains why psychologists say that almost everything we do is to earn the respect of others, or at least to avoid losing their respect. The fourth cause of negative emotions, and the worst of all, is blaming. When I draw the negative emotions tree in my seminars, I illustrate the trunk of the tree as the propensity to blame other people for our problems. Once you cut down the trunk of the tree, all the fruits of the tree, all the other negative emotions die immediately. Just as when you jerk the plug out of the wall that lights up the Christmas lights in the tree, all the lights go out instantly. The antidote for negative emotions of all kinds is for you to accept complete responsibility for your situation. The very act of accepting responsibility short circuits and cancels out any negative emotions you may be experiencing. It's only when you free yourself from negative emotions by taking complete responsibility that you can begin to set and achieve goals in every area of your life. It's only when you are free mentally and emotionally that you can begin to channel your energies and enthusiasms in a forward direction. On the other hand, once you accept total responsibility for your life, there are no limits on what you can be, do, and have. From now on, Refuse to blame anyone for anything, past, present, or future. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. If you make a mistake, say, I'm sorry, and get busy rectifying the situation. To keep your mind positive, refuse to criticize, complain about, or condemn other people for anything. Every time you criticize someone else, complain about something you don't like, or condemn someone else for something that they have done or not done, you trigger feelings of negativity and anger within yourself. And you are the one who suffers. Your negativity doesn't affect the other person at all. Being angry with someone is allowing him or her to control your emotions and often the entire quality of your life at long distance. This is just plain silly. Remember, positive emotions of happiness, excitement, love and enthusiasm make you feel more powerful and confident. Once you decide to accept complete responsibility for yourself, your situation and for everything that happens to you, you can turn confidently toward your work and the affairs of your life. You become the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. In a study done in New York some years ago, 
Researchers found that the top 3% of people in every field had a special attitude that set them apart from average performers in their industries. It was this. They viewed themselves as self-employed throughout their careers, no matter who signed their paychecks. They saw themselves as responsible for their companies, exactly as if they owned the companies personally. You should do the same. If there's anything in your life that you don't like, you are responsible. You are responsible for the consequences of your actions and your behaviors. You're where you are and what you are today because you have decided to be there. In a large sense, you are earning today exactly what you have decided to earn, no more and no less. If you're not happy with your current income, decide to earn more. Set it as a goal, make a plan, and then get busy doing what you need to do to earn what it is you want to earn. Just as the president of a corporation is responsible for the strategy and activities of that corporation, you are also responsible for the personal strategic planning of your own life and career. You are responsible for overall management strategy, setting goals, making plans, establishing measures and performing to get results. You are responsible for achieving certain outputs for the quality and quantity of the work that you produce and the results you are expected to get. As president, you are responsible for marketing strategy for self-promotion and advancement, for creating your image and packaging yourself to be able to sell yourself for the very highest price in a competitive market. You are responsible for financial strategy for deciding how much of your services you want to sell and how much you want to earn, how rapidly you want to grow your income year by year, how much you want to save and invest, and how much you want to be worth when you retire. You're responsible for your people strategy and your relationships, both at home and at work. One piece of advice I give my students is to choose your boss with care. Your choice of a boss is going to have a major impact on how much you earn, how fast you get ahead, and how happy you will be at your job. By the same token, your choice of a mate and friends will have as much or more to do with your success and happiness than any other decisions you make. Finally, as president, you are in complete charge of personal research and development, personal training and learning. It is up to you to determine the talents, skills, abilities and core competencies you will need to earn the kind of money you want to earn in the months and years ahead. It is then your responsibility to make the investment and take the time to learn and develop these skills. Refuse to whine and complain about things that happened in the past which cannot be changed. Instead, orient yourself toward the future and think of what you want and where you're going. Above all, think about your goals. The very act of thinking about your goals makes you positive and purposeful once more. That there's a direct relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept and the amount of control you feel. The more you say, I am responsible, the more of an internal locus of control you develop within yourself and the more powerful and confident you feel. There's also a direct relationship between responsibility and happiness. The more responsibility you accept, the happier you become. It seems that all three, responsibility, control, and happiness, go together. The more responsibility you accept, the greater amount of control you feel you have. The greater amount of control you feel you have, the happier and more confident you become. When you feel positive and in control of your life, you will set bigger and more challenging goals for yourself. You will also have the drive and determination to achieve them. You will feel as though you hold your whole life in your own hands and that you can make it into whatever you decide to. The starting point of goal setting is for you to realize that you have virtually unlimited potential to be, have, or do anything you really want in life. If you simply want it badly enough and are willing to work long enough and hard enough to achieve it. The second part of goal setting is for you to accept complete responsibility for your life and for everything that happens to you, with no blaming and no excuses. With these two concepts clearly in mind, that you have unlimited potential on the one hand and that you are completely responsible on the other, you are now ready to move to the next step, which is to begin designing your ideal future. Now, here are three things you can do immediately 
to put these ideas into action. First, identifying your biggest problem or source of negativity in life today. In what ways are you responsible for this situation? Second of all, see yourself as the president of your own company. How would you act differently if you own 100% of the shares of your current company? And third, resolve today to stop blaming anyone else for anything and instead accept complete responsibility in every area of your life. What actions should you be taking? But what I teach is the importance of goal setting, setting very clear goals, making plans to achieve the goal, and then working on those goals each day. Because when you are working toward a goal, your self-confidence goes up, your energy goes up, you actually become more intelligent. So this feeling of forward movement is one of the most important success secrets in the world. Successful people are always moving toward something important to them. And the feeling of movement makes them happy. It releases endorphins in your brain, which cause you to be more creative, more positive, stronger, more powerful. Hello? Did you know that only 3% of adults have clear, written, measurable, time-bounded goals and plans to achieve them? And by every statistic, these 3% accomplish 10 times as much as people, no goals at all. Now why is it then, most people have no goals? If you earn 10 times as much goals, if you have 10 times as much success with goals, why don't people all have goals? Well, there are five myths about setting goals and objectives that might help you rethink your decisions about not setting goals for yourself. The first myth is, I already have goals, but I don't need to set any. People who say this also say that their goals are, I want to be rich, and I want to be thin, and I want to be happy and successful and popular and live my dreams. These are not goals. These are wishes and fantasies common to all mankind. Crazy people and homeless people have these as goals. They're not goals. They're just fantasies. Sometimes they're just delusions. A goal, on the other hand, it's like a beautiful home, carefully designed and upgraded continually, uh, approved regularly and worked on constantly. It's not in writing, it's merely a dream or a wish. We say that a goal that is not in writing is a wish with no energy behind it. It has no power in your life. It's just a vague objective. It comes in and out of your life, sort of like a sunrise, sunset, without ever pushing anything. Now the second most common myth that people don't set goals is, I don't need goals, I'm doing fine. Living your life without goals and objectives is like setting off an unknown country with no road signs and no road map. But you have no choice then but to make it up as you go along, reacting and responding to whatever happens all day, all week, all month, and then just hoping for the best. If you were doing well today without written goals and plan, wow, it means you could probably be doing many times better in the future if you had clear targets to aim at and the ability to measure your progress as you go along. It's vital to have goals in every part of your life. Myth number three about goal setting is, I don't need written goals, I have them all in my mind. Now the average stream of consciousness includes about 1,500 thoughts or words a minute race through your mind like a river. If your goals are only in your mind, they're invariably jumbled up, vague, confused, contradictory, and deficient in many ways. If your goals are just tumbling around in your mind, they offer no clarity and they give you no motive power. You become like a ship without a rudder. Drifting with the tide, crashing into the rocks, and eventually never realize core. Fourth most common myth is, I don't know how to set goals. Well, no wonder. You can take a master's degree at a leading university 
and never receive a single hour of instruction goal setting and goal achieving. But fortunately, setting a goal is ill. Like time management, bitching, selling, or managing your, even riding a bicycle, anything else that you need to become a highly productive person. All skills, this was the great turning point in my life. All essential skills are learnable. Everybody who can do it today at one time could do it at all. What others have learned, can learn well. You can learn the skill of goal setting by practice through repetition until it becomes as easy, automatic as reading in, reading out. And from the very first day that you begin setting goals, progress you will make and the successes you will enjoy will absolutely astonish you. Now the final myth that people use not to set goals is goals don't work. Life is too unpredictable. Well, here's an analogy. When a plane takes off for a distant city, it will be off course 99% of the time. The complexity of the avionics and the skill of the pilots are focused on genuine course section. Now it's the same in life. But when you have a clear, long-term goal, specific plans to achieve it, you may have to change course many times, and you will, but you will eventually arrive at your destination health, wealth, and great success. You have two choices in life. You can either work on your own goals, or you can work someone else and work on achieving their goal. When you learn how to set goals for yourself, you take complete control of your life and jump to the front of the line in your potential great achievement. Any road will get you there. And as Wayne Gretzky said, you miss every shot you don't take. The very act of taking the time to decide what you really want in each area of your life can change your life completely. The 3% factor. It seems that only 3% of adults have written goals and plans, and this 3% burn more than all of the other 97% put together. Why is this? The simplest answer is that if you have a clear goal and a plan to achieve it, you therefore have a track to run on every single day. Instead of being sidetracked by distractions and diversions, getting lost or going astray, more and more of your time is focused in a straight line, from where you are to where you want to go. This is why people with goals accomplish so much more than people without them. The tragedy is that most people think that they already have goals, but what they really have are hopes and wishes. However, hope is not a strategy for success, and a wish has been defined as a goal with no energy behind it. Goals that are not written down and developed into plans are like bullets without powder in the cartridge. People with unwritten goals go through life shooting blanks. Because they think they already have goals, they never engage in the hard, disciplined effort of goal setting. And this is the master skill of success. Multiply your chances of success. In 2006, USA Today reported a study in which researchers selected a large number of people who had made New Year's resolutions. They then divided these people into two categories, those who had set New Year's resolutions and written them down, and those who had set New Year's resolutions but had not written them down. Twelve months later, they followed up on the respondents in the study, and what they found was astonishing. Of the people who had set New Year's resolutions but had not written them down, only 4% had actually followed through on their resolutions. But among the group who had written down their New Year's resolutions, an exercise requiring only a couple of minutes, 44% had followed through on them. This is a difference of more than 1100% in success that it was achieved by the simple act of crystallizing the resolutions on paper. The Discipline of Writing in my experience working with several million people over the past 25 years, the disciplined act of writing out goals, making plans for accomplishing them, and then working on those goals daily increases the likelihood of achieving your goals by 10 times or 1,000%. This doesn't mean that writing out your goals guarantees success, but rather only that it increases the probability of success by 10 times. 
These are very good odds to have working in your favor, especially when there is no cost or risk involved in putting pen to paper. Just a little time. Writing is called a psychoneuromotor activity. The act of writing forces you to think and concentrate. It forces you to choose what is more important to you and your future. As a result, when you write down a goal, you impress it into your subconscious mind, which then goes to work 24 hours a day to bring your goal to reality. Sometimes I tell my seminar audiences, only 3% of adults have written goals, and everyone else works for those people. In life, you either work to achieve your own goals or you work to achieve the goals of someone else. Which is it going to be? Success versus Failure Mechanisms Your brain has both a success mechanism and a failure mechanism. The failure mechanism is the temptation to follow the undisciplined path of least resistance to do what is fine and easy rather than what is hard and necessary. Your failure mechanism operates automatically throughout your life, which is the major reason why most people fail to fulfill their individual potentials. While your failure mechanism functions automatically, your success mechanism is triggered by a goal. When you decide on a goal, you override your failure mechanism and can help you change the direction of your life. You go from being a ship without a rudder, drifting with the tide, to being a ship with a rudder, a compass and a clear destination, sailing in a straight direction towards your goal. The Power of Goals A client of mine recently told me an interesting story. He said that he had attended one of my seminars in 1994, where I spoke about the importance of writing down goals and making plans for accomplishing them. At that time, he was 35 years old, selling cars for a dealership in Nashville and earning about $50,000 a year. He told me that that day changed his life. He began writing out his goals and plans and working on them daily. Twelve years later, he was earning more than $1 million a year and was the president of a fast-growing company that sells services to some of the biggest companies in the country. He told me that he could not imagine what his life would have been like if he had not taken out a piece of paper and written down the goals he wanted to achieve in the years ahead. Take control of your life. Aristotle wrote that human beings are teleological organisms, which simply means that we are purpose-driven. Therefore, you only feel happy and in control of your life when you have a clear goal that you are working toward each day. This also means that this ability to become a lifelong goal-setter is one of the most important disciplines you will ever develop. In nature, the homing pigeon is a remarkable bird. It has an uncanny instinct that enables it to fly back to its home roost no matter how far away it starts or in what direction it must go. You could take a homing pigeon out of its roost, put it in a cage, put the cage in a box, cover the box with a blanket, and put the covered box in the back of a pickup truck. You could then drive 1,000 miles in any direction, open up the truck, take out the box, take off the blanket, open the cage, and throw the homing pigeon up into the air. The homing pigeon will circle three times, get its bearings, and then fly straight back to its home roost. This is the only creature on Earth that has this ability, except for human beings, except for you. You also have this remarkable homing ability within your own brain, but with one special difference. A homing pigeon seems to know instinctively exactly where its home roost is located. It then has the ability to fly directly back to that roost. In contrast, when human beings program a goal into their minds, they can then set out without having any idea where they will go or how they will achieve that goal. But by some miracle, they will begin to move unerringly toward that goal, and the goal will begin to move toward them. Still, many people are hesitant to set goals. They say, I want to be financially independent, but I have no idea how I'm going to get there. As a result, they don't even set financial success as a goal. But the good news is that you don't need to know how to get there. You just need to be clear about what you want to accomplish, and the goal-striding mechanism in your brain will guide you unerringly to your destination. For example, you can decide that you are going to find your ideal job, in which you work for and with people you like and respect, and do work that is both challenging and enjoyable. You take some time to write down an exact description of what your ideal job and workplace would look like, and then you go out here to the job market and begin searching. 
After a series of interviews, you will often walk into the right place at the right time and find yourself in exactly the right job. Almost everyone has had this experience at one time or another. You can have it by design rather than by chance, simply by developing absolute clarity about what you really want. The seven step method to achieving your goals. There are seven simple steps that you can follow to set and achieve your goals faster. There are more complex and detailed goal achieving methodologies, but the seven step method will enable you to accomplish 10 times more than you've ever accomplished before, and you will do so far faster than you can currently imagine. Step one, decide exactly what you want. Be specific. If you want to increase your income, decide on a specific amount of money rather than to just make more money. Two, write it down. A goal that is not in writing is like cigarette smoke. It drifts away and disappears. It is vague and insubstantial. It has no force, effect, or power. But a written goal becomes something that you can see, touch, read, and modify if necessary. Step 3. Set a deadline for your goal. Pick a reasonable time period and write down the date when you want to achieve it. If it's a big enough goal, set a final deadline and then set sub-deadlines or interim steps between where you are today and where you want to be in the future. A deadline serves as a forcing system in your brain. Just as you often get more done when you're under the pressure of a specific deadline, your subconscious mind works faster and more efficiently when you have decided that you want to achieve a goal by a specific time. The rule is, there are no unrealistic goals, there are only unrealistic deadlines. What do you do if you don't achieve your goal by your deadline? Simple. You set another deadline. A deadline is just a guesstimate. Sometimes you will achieve your goal before the deadline, sometimes at the deadlines, and sometimes after the deadline. When you set your goal, it will be within the context of a certain set of external circumstances. But these circumstances may change, causing you to change your deadline as well. Be flexible. Step number four. Make a list of everything that you could think of that you could possibly do to achieve your goal. As Henry Ford said, the biggest goal can be accomplished if you just break it down into a nut small steps. Make a list of the obstacles and difficulties that you will have to overcome, both external and internal, in order to achieve your goal. Make a list of the additional knowledge and skills that you will require in order to achieve your goal. Make a list of the people whose cooperation and support you will require to achieve your goal. Make a list of everything that you can think of that you will have to do, and then add to this list as new tasks and responsibilities occur to you. Keep writing until your list is complete. Step 5. Organize your list by both sequence and priority. A list of activities organized by sequence requires that you decide what you need to do first, what you need to do second, and what you need to do later on. In addition, a list organized by priority enables you to determine what is more important and what is less important. Sometimes sequence and priority are the same, but often they are not. For example, if you want to start a particular kind of business, the first item in order sequence might be for you to purchase a book or enroll in a course on that business. But what is most important is your ability to develop a business plan based on complete market research that you can use to gather the resources you need and actually start the business you have in mind. Step 6. Take action on your plan immediately. Take the first step, and then the second step, and the third step. Get going, get busy, move quickly, don't delay. Remember, procrastination is not only the thief of time, it's the thief of life. The difference between success and failures in life is Simply that winners take the first step. They are action-oriented. As they said in Star Trek, they go boldly where no man has ever gone before. Winners are willing to take action with no guarantees of success. Though they're willing to face failure and disappointment, they're always willing to take action as well. Step 7. Do something every day that moves you in the direction of your major goal. This is the key step that will guarantee your success. Do something seven days a week, 365 days a year. Do anything that moves you at least one step closer to the goal that is most important to you at that time. When you do something every day that moves you in the direction of your goal, you develop momentum. 
This momentum, this sense of forward motion, motivates, inspires, and energizes you. As you develop momentum, you'll find it increasingly easy to take more steps towards your goal. In no time at all, you'll have developed the discipline of setting and achieving your goals. It will soon become easy and automatic. You will soon develop the habit and the discipline of working towards your goals all the time. The 10 Goal Exercise This is one of the most powerful goal-achieving methods I have ever discovered. I teach it all over the world and I practice it myself almost every day. Here's how it works. Take out a clean sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write the word Goals and Today's Date. Then, discipline yourself to write down 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Write down financial, family goals, and fitness goals, as well as goals for personal possessions like a house or a car. Don't worry for the moment about how you're going to achieve these goals. Just write them down as quickly as you can. You can write as many as 15 goals if you like, but this exercise requires that you write down a minimum of 10 within 3 to 5 minutes. Select one goal. Once you've written out your 10 goals, imagine for the moment that you can achieve all the goals on your list if you wanted them long enough and hard enough. Also imagine that you have a magic wand and that you can wave that will enable you to achieve any one goal on your list within 24 hours. If you could achieve any one goal on your list within 24 hours, which one would have the greatest positive impact on your life right now? Which one goal would change or improve your life more than anything else? Which one goal, if you were to achieve it, would help you to achieve more of your other goals than anything else. Whatever your answer to this question, put a circle around this goal and then write it at the top of a clean sheet of paper. This goal then becomes your major definite purpose. It becomes your focal point and the organizing principle of your future activities. Make a plan. Once you've written out this goal clearly and specifically and made it measurable, set a deadline on your goal. Your subconscious mind needs a deadline so that it can focus and concentrate all your mental powers on goal attainment. Make a list of everything that you could think of that you could do to achieve your goal. Organize this list by sequence and priority. Select the most important or logical next step in your plan and take action on it immediately. Take the first step. Do something. Do anything. Resolve to work on this goal every single day until it's achieved. From this moment forward, as far as you are concerned, failure is not an option. Once you've decided that this one goal can have the greatest positive impact on your life, and you've set it as your major definite purpose, resolve that you will work toward this goal as hard as you can, as long as you can, and that you will never give up until it's achieved. This decision alone can change your life. Use mindstorming to get started. Here's another technique that you can use to dramatically increase the likelihood that you will achieve your most important goal. This is the most powerful creative thinking technique I've ever seen. More people have become wealthy using this method than any other way. Take another clean sheet of paper. Write out your major definite purpose, your number one goal, at the top of the page in the form of a question. Then, discipline yourself to write a minimum of 20 answers to the question. For example, if your goal is to earn a certain amount of money by a certain date, you would write the question, how can I earn this amount of money by this specific date? You then discipline yourself to generate 20 answers to your question. This exercise of mindstorming will activate your mind, unleash your creativity and give you ideas that you may have never thought of before. The first three to five answers will be easy. The next five will be difficult. And the last ten answers will be harder than you can imagine, at least the first time you do this exercise. Nonetheless, you must exert your discipline and willpower to persist until you have written down at least 20 answers. Once you've generated 20 answers, look over your list and select one of those answers to take action on immediately. It seems that when you take action on a single idea on your list, it triggers more ideas and motivates you to take action on even more of these answers. The Great Law of Cause and Effect the most important application of the law of cause and effect is that thoughts are causes and conditions are effects. Your thoughts create the conditions of your life. When you change your thinking, you change your life. 
your outer world becomes a mirror image reflection of your inner world. Perhaps the greatest discovery in the history of thought is that you become what you think about most of the time. Moreover, the teacher John Boyle said, whatever you can think about on a continuing basis, you can have. Napoleon Hill, author of the success classic Think and Grow Rich, which was first published in 1939 and is still selling today, said, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. When you think about your goal continually, and work on it every day, more and more of your mental resources will be concentrated on moving you toward that goal, and moving your goal toward you. The discipline of daily goal setting will make you a powerful, purposeful, and irresistible person. You'll develop self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect. As you feel yourself moving toward your goals faster and faster, you will ultimately become unstoppable. In the next chapter, I'll explain how the use of self-discipline to develop personal excellence is the most powerful step you can take to achieve all your material and emotional goals. The principle of success in life is the principle of purpose and the establishment of clear central purpose or goal in life. Mr. H. L. Hunt, the great oil billionaire, who was a bankrupt cotton farmer in Arkansas at the age of 32 in the middle of the Depression, and who at the age of 56 was earning $3 million a day, and the age of 76, shortly before he died, was earning $5 million a day, was on a television show. And the moderator asked him, Mr. Hunt, you've been so successful in your life, could you give our viewers some ideas on how they could be more successful too? Don't let two things necessary for success. He said, the first thing is that you have to decide exactly what it is you want. He said, that's the starting point. And even if people do decide exactly what it is they want. He said, the second thing is that you have to determine the price you're going to have to pay to get it. And then resolve to pay that. Determine the price you're going to have to pay. Establish a clear central purpose for your life. And it is the starting point of all great success. However, we're programmed for failure. And if we continually seek the fast, easy way through life. And the fast, easy way through life inevitably ends with failure and underachievement. As soon as you determine upon a goal, something that you really, really want, you override your failure mechanism and begin freeing yourself from the gravitational pull of the E-factor. Your brain has the same mechanism that is in the brain of the homing pigeon. That when you program a goal into your brain, you immediately set up a type of vibration that goes out from you and radiates out from you and it begins to attract into your life the people, circumstances and opportunities that enable you to accomplish it. But if you do not have a clear goal or set of goals, and if you do not have plans to work toward those goals, then this mechanism doesn't work at all. It lays dormant within your brain. An average person with average talents and abilities and average education can outstrip the most brilliant genius in our society if that average person has clear, focused goals. And if the genius does not, this is critical. And that's why you see men and women who start from virtually nothing and they make wonderful progress in their lives and almost invariably you see it starts with a goal. Some people don't set a goal till they're 30, some until they're 40, some till they're 50, some people never do. But it's important to understand this, that without goals you are doomed forever to work for people who do. Making decisions and setting goals is hard work. And that's why only winners have goals. Losers are lazy. They won't take the time and effort to think through what they really want and then make plans for its accomplishment. Now what do you want? Have you ever decided that? What exactly do you want? Remember, you can have anything you want, that you can clearly define it, that you can't hit a target, that you can't see. Where do you want to be in one, two, three, four, five years? Where do you want to be next year and the year after and the year after? What sort of progress do you want to make? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have? What level of health do you want to have? What kind of relationships do you want? Most of all, how badly do you want them? If you want it badly enough and are willing to pay the price. If you want it badly enough and are willing to pay the price. Now the rules regarding the price of success are simple. There's just two of them. Number one is you always have to pay full price for success. And number two is you always have to pay in advance. Now here's some key points on goals. And please remember these. The first key point is that your ability to set goals and to make plans for their accomplishment is the master skill of success. You see, setting goals is hard. Setting goals requires delaying gratification. Setting goals means taking some time aside and sitting down and really thinking through what it is you want in each area of your life. Number two, your goals must be congruent with your basic values. What are your basic values in life? 
What would you live for? What would you fight for? What would you sacrifice for? What would you die for? What are the most important things to you in life? And are your goals, are your daily activities congruent with those values? Sometimes I'd be in a job that I hated, and yet everybody around me thought it was a great job. And the reason for that, as I learned, is that for them and their values, it was the ideal job. But for me, and in many cases for you and your values, it was the wrong job. Number three, your goals must be in writing. You should describe them in clear, specific, vivid language, in every detail, as though you were ordering something to be manufactured for you on the other side of the country. Writing down your goals programs them into the subconscious mind. If you cannot write your goals down clearly and describe them, it means one of two things. Either you don't know what they are, or you are not committed to accomplishing them. Sit down and rewrite your major goals. Write them down briefly, and write them down as though they were already accomplished. I earn $30,000 a year. I weigh 175 pounds. I am an excellent salesperson, or whatever your goal or objective is. But write it out in the present tense as though we're already accomplished. And every time you write it down, you reprogram it into the subconscious mind. And if you will do that for the next 30 days, you will make more progress in the next 30 days than you made in the last six months. You will be astonished. And the reason why this works is that every time you write it down, you increase the intensity of vibration going out of your mind into the world. And this law of attraction will then attract back into your life people and circumstances that will assist you to accomplish those goals. Fourth point in goal setting, you must have a major definite purpose. One goal that is more important than any other. You can have many different goals, but you must have one goal, which is number one. There's a line in the Bible that says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And what it means is if you try to do two things at once, or you have two goals with equal priority, you'll end up doing neither and doing neither of them very well. Whichever goal would have the greatest positive impact on every other area of your life, set that as your major definite purpose. Remember, your major definite purpose must be measurable. You can have a variety of different goals, but your major definite purpose, your number one goal, must be measurable. For instance, you could have a goal to be happy, but that couldn't be your major definite purpose. You could have a goal for weight loss, and that's a measurable goal. You can have a goal for income increase, and that is a measurable goal. So make sure your goals are measurable. Make sure your goals are challenging and believable and achievable. Make sure that your goals are just slightly beyond anything that you've done before so that it makes you stretch, and especially your major definite purpose. But each of your goals should be something beyond anything you've accomplished. And finally, under number four, you must know why you want to achieve your goal. If there's one or two reasons for achieving a goal, you'll have a little bit of motivation. If you have five or ten reasons, you'll have more motivation. But if you have 50 reasons for achieving a particular goal, you'll have so much motivation that nothing will be able to stop you. Okay, point number five. If you don't have a major definite purpose, make it your number one goal to find your major definite purpose. As a matter of fact, 95% of the population hasn't the slightest idea what the central purpose is of their lives. So if you start off and you don't have a major definite purpose, don't worry about it. It means that you're exactly the same as everybody else, but set it as your major goal to find it. And keep persisting, keep thinking, keep reflecting, keep reviewing what it is that you could be your major definite purpose, and I promise you, you will find it. And when you find it, it's like your whole life goes into overdrive. Make it the most important single goal of your life to find out what it is that you should be doing. Point number six, make detailed plans to achieve your goals and break your plans down into monthly, weekly, and daily activities. Always define your goals in terms of the activities you will have to engage in to achieve them. Do something extra every day to move you towards your most important goals. Number seven, remember this, the more you practice setting clear goals, the better you get. When you become an expert at setting goals and making plans, your success is assured. Even if you are a brilliant human being, extremely intelligent, very capable and talented, without a goal, you will not be able to construct a great life. And as I said before, you will have to spend the rest of your life working for people who have clear specific goals and clear blueprints. Now the psychology of goal setting requires clear specific goals, keenly desired because they give power, purpose and direction to your life. Thinking about your goals, visualizing them as though they already existed, repeating and reaffirming them to yourself, builds the drive, commitment and momentum that moves you out of the comfort zone. Here's a good goal for you or a good affirmation. If you repeat over and over again, I am the best, I am the best, I am the best, I am the best, and visualize yourself as the very best in your field, when you repeat this over and over again, you set up a field of vibration and you drive the command down into the subconscious mind. And as you know, the subconscious then goes to work 
to make all of your words and actions and reactions fit a pattern consistent with those intensely desired goals. And once you believe that you are capable of accomplishing then nothing in the world can stop you. Remember, goal-centered living is a source of energy and enthusiasm. It's not possible to be motivated without goals. And when there's something that you want badly enough, you will have the excitement, the motivation, the enthusiasm, and the energy that will drive you toward accomplishing it. Every step you take toward your goal gives you a feeling of accomplishment, that win feeling that boosts your self-esteem and improves your performance. Each time your self-esteem goes up and you like yourself better, you feel energy and enthusiasm that causes you to try more things, to try other things, to hurl yourself into achieving more of the goals that are possible for you. Goals are the fuel in the furnace of achievement. The more goals you have, the more excited you are about life, the more progress you make. In my estimation, 80-90% of the people who are in hospitals and clinics in America are there because they have no sense of meaning and purpose in life. In my estimation, most of the unhappiness in our society comes from people who do not know where they're going. And because they lack that sense of inner worth, that sense of central purpose, they become angry and frustrated and alienated and hostile and they take it out in drugs and alcohol and negativity uh, and so on and so on. As soon as you begin setting worthwhile goals and working toward them, you feel positive, happy, and in control of your life. We know that we only feel positive about ourselves to the degree to which we feel we are in control of our own lives, and that we feel negative about ourselves to the degree to which we feel we are out of control. The fact that your conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time, positive or negative. And if you think about your goals, you can't think about something negative simultaneously because it's pretty hard to worry when you're busy working towards something that's important to you. It's, remember, it takes mental effort and self-discipline to keep your mind on your goals. But if you force yourself to think only about what you want for just 21 days, the same period of time that it takes for a chicken to hatch an egg, you force yourself to think about it for only 21 days, you will lay down a new positive habit pattern that will stay with you throughout the rest of your life. Well, what have we learned? Number one, we've beaten this to death. Setting clear specific goals and writing them down and making step-by-step -step plans for their accomplishment is essential to your success. This is hard work, which is why losers don't do it. Instead, they drift aimlessly, confused and unhappy. You must discipline yourself to be intensely goal-oriented if you want to be successful. Success is tons of discipline. Number two, decisiveness. Deciding exactly what it is you want in life is the starting point of all achievement. The positive habit of decisiveness gives courage, clarity, and force to your personality. Number three, self-esteem. The key to success and peak performance comes from setting goals consistent with your values. That winning feeling which comes from making a measurable progress toward goals that are important to you. Number four, your subconscious mind is activated by goals in the form of clear mental pictures and positive affirmations. To visualize your ideal goal complete in every detail, see it as though it existed already. Speak about your goal to yourself in positive affirmative language. I earn $30,000 per annum. I can do it. I feel terrific. I am excellent at my work. Say this over and over again. Number five, read and review your goals and plans every day. Take 30 minutes each day to think and reflect upon your goals, always seeking newer, better, more creative ways of achieving them. In fact, you will find that the 30 minutes that you take at the beginning of each day to think about your goals, to reflect on what you're doing and how you could do it better, to revise your goals, to fit in with new information, will be the most valuable 30 minutes that you ever spend. All great achievers, in almost all the biographies and autobiographies you'll ever read, you'll find that people begin to become great when they begin to spend time by themselves each day thinking about who they are. Remember, nothing succeeds like success. We all have fears of failure. We all are afraid of risk. We're all afraid of loss. But we have to make a habit of confronting those fears of failure and moving forward. That is why successful people are those who make a habit of success. They start from the same background of limitation and underachievement that everybody else starts from. But then they make a habit of succeeding. This is the key. Learn to succeed by succeeding and laying down a habit of success, which can only be accomplished by achieving challenging, worthwhile goals. Remember, write your goals down. Organize them in order of priority. Select your major definite purpose. Make a plan for its accomplishment. Define the plan in terms of activities and get to work right today and do something extra every day to move you towards your goal. And your success is virtually assured.